Kintsugi Heroes acknowledges funding and was made possible with support from the Community Broadcasting Foundation. Find out more at cbf.org.au. Welcome to the Kintsugi Heroes podcast, where we share inspirational stories of everyday people going through different challenges and how they overcome them. Please be aware that the story you're about to hear may have moments of deeply felt emotions and personal experiences. If anything you hear has a triggering effect, please reach out to someone who can help keep you safe. If you love this conversation, we'd love you to like and share it with your friends so we can continue to share more inspiration and hope to as many people as possible. Now, listen up for our next hero story. This conversation is with Francois Du Neuville. Honestly, it blew me away. I had no idea what was going to come, just like with all of the conversations. I don't know what people's stories are before they start talking. He was a survivor of the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia. He took me through the detailed account of what happened when that tsunami hit, where he was, what he was doing, and that the months after that, the friends that he'd lost, the people that he'd lost, and how that changed his life forever. Such a monumental event, obviously, for him, but he's used it to his advantage, and now he just takes every day as a gift, and he inspires others to do the same. He's a former commando paratrooper. He's a husband and an adventurer. This is my conversation with him. I'm so grateful that he came and shared it, and now it's time for you to listen to it as well. Enjoy this one with Francois. Hello, here we are. It is another episode of Kintsugi Heroes. I'm here with Francois de Neville. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Welcome, Francois. How are you today? Hi, that was correctly pronounced. I know my name is a little bit weird to pronounce, but thank you. And I'm doing very great today. Lovely. Thank you for being here. And whereabouts are you in the world? I'm right now in North Carolina in the US, but I'm a nomad. It's been like seven years I'm traveling. So uh, last week I was in Brazil, the week before in Argentina, and next week I'm going to be in Mexico. So I'm moving a lot. Okay, wonderful. I love that kind of uh, openness to exploring and nomadic lifestyle. It's exciting and I hope it's working well for you. I don't even see myself going back to living in one place for a few years. Ah, lovely. Well, thanks for pausing long enough to meet with me and um, coming on to Kintsugi Heroes. I just want to First of all, acknowledge that you're here and you're here to share a story. Uh, These are not always easy stories to share. It takes some bravery, some vulnerability, and I just want to honor that. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate (laughs) Well, this is about you and your story. So I'm going to hand over to you and ask you to take us back to the beginning. Um, Just to give you a little bit of context. So I'm Francois. I'm from Belgium. I grew up there. I had a... This desire since I'm a kid to to do things that are really challenging. You got to imagine me. I had dreadlocks till here. I was living with my guitar and my skateboard. And one day I go to the bedroom of my parents and I was like 17. I said, Dad, Mom, um, I'm going to join the military. And they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they were so like, oh, that's that's odd. So yeah, I want to become uh, a platoon leader in the Commando Paratroopers. And I went to the military academy. I... I passed the exam with my dreadlocks because I was saying like, if I'm not selected, I'm not cutting them for sure. <laughs> that was quite funny. And I got selected. I, uh, I served in the military for nine years and I made my way to become a platoon leader in the Commander Paratroopers. I had a great life. I mean, that was one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. Being married is really easy next to it, seriously. Um, this was very, very hard. <laughs> I was there. I was super happy. I love my life. I love the job I was doing, I mean, there was not a normal week. You know, we were just doing uh, parachuting, helicopter training, boat training, climbing, close combat, all of those kind of exciting things. So my life was really extraordinary. I had good friends, made good money, and my whole career was in front of me. But still inside, I had this, this voice saying, like, there is more, there is more. And when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an explorer. You know, Indiana Jones, my idol. I just wanted to go on a boat, sail the world, and travel and explore. But I was postponing this because, yeah, you know, you got to find a job, you got to study, and then you have a job. And well, like, it doesn't really make sense to leave now. 
But one day I was, if I don't leave today, when is it going to be? I'm going to keep postponing that forever. And it's only going to be more difficult, right? More responsibilities, etc. And so it was a, a very scary move, but I decided to quit. I quit my job. I sold everything I had. I sold my car, my computer, even clothes. I put everything I had left in the backpack and I went to travel the world. A few years before, I think one and a half year before, I met a beautiful Dutch woman in Indonesia on a, on a small island while I was traveling and I ended up admiring her. Uh, and so she was already traveling at the time and I joined her on the road. And I had a big dream was to, to travel around the world and her dream was to live in Nepal. And when we met on this, on this really tiny island in Indonesia, I shared my dream, but I was like, hey, you know what? It's not really making sense to quit. And after all this work and effort to get there, but she cheered me on on, man, what are you waiting for? And I was the first person who was actually supporting this decision because most of my friends were like, come on, don't be stupid. Everybody's having a hard time to find a job and pays the bills and, and, and you just have everything. So what, what are you doing? But I did it anyway. And so we went traveling and we had a great time. The idea was we traveled the world and we're going to go live in Nepal. That was her dream. And that's what we did. The problem is I was traveling. I had such a great time, amazing adventures from all over the world. But every time I was looking about what was coming next, you know, I was in Colombia thinking about, oh, I cannot wait to be in Japan. I was in Japan thinking, oh, diving in the Philippines is going to be great. I was in the Philippines. I was thinking, oh, Indonesia is going to be so good. And I kept living for something that was about to come. And that kind of robbed me from the present moment. But I did not really realize that in the moment. I was just having this fear of missing out and going just from one place to the other, to the other, to the other. Until we arrived in Nepal and then we tried to live there. But we realized that was really difficult to get the, the work permit, etc. And so after five months trying to figure things out, we realized, well, that's probably not going to work. And we were a little bit sad thinking, oh, the dream is collapsing. And I was walking in the second biggest city of the country in Pokhara. And I saw the paragliders in the sky. I was like, mm, I got an idea. I went to a paragliding school and I asked, like, if I have a work permit as a paragliding pilot, can, can I can I stay here? I said, yeah, it's possible for a foreigner to obtain a work permit. I said, okay, how long does it take to learn to be a pilot? Like, phew, at least two, three years if you really work hard. So I came back to my wife running. I said, I have an idea. I'm going to become a paragliding pilot and we're going to be able to stay here. I never flew before. Like, okay, you know what? Let's make this happen. So my wife found a job in Indonesia and she would be bringing the money and I would just spend all my time flying, flying, flying intensively so I could get the license and the permit to really live our dream. So this was a multi-year project. And so we did it. So we went to Indonesia, she found a job and I started flying, flying, flying. So we were again, putting a bit of life on pause to something that was coming in the future. And one day I, I found myself at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, there was a paragliding competition on the island of Sulawesi in North uh, Indonesia. And I decided to go there in the small city of Palu and uh, participated to the competition. And that was the day two, I think. The weather was exceptional. I mean, it was beautiful, tropical paradise. Everything went great. I was doing great, great uh, scores with my team. So I was really happy. And that day I go back to the hotel. The hotel was right on the coast. I mean, we could see the sea and the beach in front of us. It was just beautiful. And I decided to go with my friend to a little local event on, in, in the city center. And so we get out of the hotel. And as we are walking in front of the lobby, suddenly the ground started shaking. It started shaking so strong that we fell down. But we could just not stay standing up. The ground was literally making waves. I mean, it was so insane. I was just looking around like, what is happening? It's like defying all the laws of physics. Like my mind could not comprehend what was happening. I was very confused. And so I fell down. I was there and my friend is next to me and suddenly is above me. And then I'm above him because the ground was really moving and the sound coming from so deep earth was, was terrifying. And suddenly I hear this, this very loud noise behind us. And as I turn my head, I see the whole hotel is collapsing. I was horrified. Just a few seconds before, I was just getting out, waving goodbye to the receptionist. And now I'm looking at this hotel collapsing in a dust of, in a cloud of dust and debris everywhere. And I'm thinking, there are so many people still inside. I wanted to throw up. I was feeling sick. Like, what, what is happening? I tried to stand up and with my friend, we run back to the hotel thinking we're going to be, we need to help people. We need to do something. So we're looking around, we're looking at all the debris and, and the ground is still shaking. This, those massive blocks of concrete are still falling from the roof. It doesn't stop. And then 
in the in the the dust we see a little girl she was on the fifth floor and she was hanging being trapped in in metallic bars she was there and we looked at her like we're going to go to help her my friend is doing one step forward and i caught him by the shoulder massive block of concrete again falling and crashing in front of us and i'm like well we need to be careful as much as we want to help people it would be stupid to die just right here now trying to help you know and so we're there we're waiting for an opportunity but in the same time we're like hey we cannot just stay here i was looking at this leader she was so terrified and, and people yelling around like okay you know what Let, let's screw it let's do it and so we started climbing on the debris of the hotel trying to be careful to not be smashed by those big debris falling all apart and then we arrived at the at the height of the girl. Imagine on the fifth floor, but we could just walk on the pile of debris because the hotel was just pancaked. And so we are there. My friend is opening with me together the metallic bars. I take the little girl in my shoulder and I see those two feet, a woman crying, blood dripping. And I realize ah, that's the mother and she's trapped underneath those big block of concrete. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go put this little girl safe. And I'm going to put her as far as possible from the hotel. And then I come back to help you to lift those blocks and free up the mother. And so I start climbing down. And as I'm climbing down, I'm thinking, okay, I need to put her somewhere when, when there is nothing collapsing, right? And so my first idea was, well, on the beach, there is nothing. There were no buildings there. So I turn back. I have this little girl in my shoulder. And I start running towards the beach, which was like just a 50 meters in front of us. And as I look up to the horizon, I see this black line. Like I've never, I've never saw that before, but I knew what it was. A tsunami was coming. Now, in the moment, I didn't really realize, you know, there is an earthquake and I'm on the coast. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but, you know, in this situation, I could not really think so, so far ahead. And so I turned back to my friend and I'm yelling, man, just take shelter. There is a tsunami coming, but <laughs> way to go. You know, I was there with this five-year-old girl holding her in my arms. We were trapped between a collapsing building and a deadly tsunami in front of us. So I'm quickly looking around and I see a tree and I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my luck there. I'm running towards the tree. I throw the little, the little girl up in the tree and, I, and I'm climbing myself. Now I'm there. I'm holding on. On one side, I hold the trunk. On the other side, I hold this little girl. Same with my legs. I'm, I'm really trying to, holding as strong as possible. And I look at the wave coming. She looked at me in the eyes and I could see the, like the confusion. I remember smiling and just saying like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. But in my mind, I'm just thinking like, you're going to die. That's it. That's it. That's your last moment. I take my cell phone and I'm trying to call my wife to say, to say goodbye because we were just this three on the beach. I mean, there was we were at the front line. The, the call never went through because all the antennas were destroyed. So we had no network. I'm holding on the tree. I'm looking at the wave coming. It was coming at 700 kilometers an hour. I mean, the speed is insane. It's so fast. It was there. It's coming closer and closer around me. I can hear the people yelling, screaming, things collapsing because the ground was still shaking. The tree is moving in all directions. The wave is like 20 meters. It arrives on a small road that was just in front of us, propulsing the cars high in the sky, destroying everything on the way. It was insane, the strength of <laughs> the power of the tsunami, the power of nature. And we felt so vulnerable in that tree. I'm holding so strong and the, the wave is hitting us like a truck in my leg. Seriously, it, I was dragged, but I, I was holding so strong. And the wave passed and crashed behind in such such a noise. And I'm like, we're still there. We're still alive. And I'm holding on that tree, on this little girl. And we are wet, soaked. And we're still going all direction thinking, what next? What's going to come next? We stayed 40 minutes in the tree, but it was getting dark. It was getting dark. We could not see anything anymore. And so I was like, I need to move. If I stay here and another wave is going to come, we might die that time. But I'm also thinking if I leave the tree and there is a tsunami coming again while we're on the way, I'm also going to die. And this little girl, I mean, I was making decisions for the both of us. I decided to get down the tree to find a shelter somewhere further inland to not be there anymore. I look back to the hotel and I'm thinking about my friend. I cannot see anything. It's dark. I cannot hear anything. I'm like, it's probably dead. I put the little girl on my shoulder and down the tree, I'm trying to walk, but there is still water to here. I mean, the ground is uneven. Everything is, is damaged. There are poor lines. There, there are cars. There are debris everywhere. I mean, it's, it's such a mess. You know, I'm trying to walk, I'm trying to run, but I cannot go very far. I fall in a hole trying to keep the girl up the water and we're like, what am I doing? We're in the wrong place right now. And I'm feeling so scared that, that, that we're going to both die because of that decision. 
I remember that there was a building on the side that was that was in construction that was not completely collapsed. And so I tried to go back to this building. And as I arrived there, we climbed on the car and go on the first floor. There were no walls, so we could just see. And, and we sat there. We were soaked. I was just taking her in my arms, and we were a bit cold because it was getting dark. The ground was still moving in all direction, and we could hear the waves still crashing and destroying everything. We just had hope. That was the last thing that we had. We just were together and complete strangers. And she was just stuck with me. And and we stayed there in, the, in that building for another two hours, I think, before uh, until the water slowly started getting down. And so at that time, I said, okay, that, no, that's my chance. I'm going to try again to leave this place and go back uh, to the further in town. And so I'm getting down and then I put her on my shoulder again and I woke in the water. The water was getting lower and lower and lower. And then I realized that moment, uh, the chaos that it was, I mean, the city was on fire. Everything was burning. There was this orange light uh, floating on top. There were bodies floating in the water. Everything was destroyed. It was it was a total nightmare. And I was walking with this girl on my shoulder thinking, well, what now? And I'm walking and, and suddenly I see a group of of survivors, they were like just 100 meters in front of me. And I start running towards the group thinking, oh, there are other people there. And I'm running towards them. And as I'm approaching, I see in the middle of the group, they were my friend. Yeah, I see him, I'm like, oh, no way you dare. I, I come to him, I hug him, and I'm like, dude. And he's telling me the mother of the little girl survived. And it was such the sweetest news I could tell her, like, hey, your mom is, is it there. We're gonna we're gonna find her, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. And we regroup with other friends and um and we went to to a football field that was a little bit higher in the city and we, we sat there because nothing could collapse there but the whole night the ground was still shaking and we had a lot of friends that were missing now i got very lucky because i could get on a on a military plane that left uh like the day after i took a plane back to jakarta when my wife was we was there and yeah she thought me dead for for more than 10 hours my name came in the red list from the embassy from the missing people etc so she has she lived a complete nightmare during this time and so very quickly i was out of this natural disaster area you know i was i was back in my sitting on my couch in 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 my apartment in jakarta and it was like my body was he was there but my mind was not there i was somewhere else and I had a really hard time to reconnect. And I was just watching the news every day to, to have news from my friends because 10 of my friends were still missing. And day after day, they were just finding the bodies. So even before I left, I also went trying to, to find them. You know, I was going there with, with a small group of friends and we were in, in the hotel where they were staying and the full hotel collapsed. I was an eight-story hotel. I was just reduced to a pile of debris. And I remember... I mean, how can I forget that? But just digging with our bare hands until bleeding from our fingers, trying to, to remove the block of concrete and hopefully finding them and then discovering a body and be like, I hope it's not them. And I'm so sorry for the person that's there. And I mean, that was so difficult. When I was back looking at the news because we could not do anything by, by hand. So the machines came and, and more uh, uh, search and rescue teams. And then day after day, I would have the news that another one has been found dead. And day after day, there was even less hope that they would be surviving. So I was a really close contact with, with my friend who saved the life of the mother of this little girl. And um, I was trying to to deal with the situation as, as best as I could, but I'm not going to lie. I was in a very dark place. I just could not find joy and meaning in anything. I remember there, I was just sitting in my couch and I was so mad. I was so upset. I was so mad and angry at the universe. You know, like, why did you do that? Why is this happening? So many people suffered and and I just could not find joy in anything. I was trying to, to find ways to cope. I, I went to the gym and trying to push my body into pain so I could feel something else than in my head and my heart. You know, I was just trying to find other ways, but still it didn't help. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to, Maybe I'm going to share my message because I started getting calls from different journalists from different countries saying, hey, you're a hero. You saved this little girl. And that just made me sick. I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. This is one lucky story. 4,000 people died. Like, what are you talking about? And I was so upset to have those calls and, and being asked for interviews. And in a moment, I was like, oh, but wait a second. Maybe I can use my story. And so I said yes to one. I said, okay, I'm going to talk. And I asked the only condition I want to make a call for donation. And it worked out well. Actually, I gathered almost $15,000 and I came back to the to the disaster area to support the victim and, 
and do activities with the kids in the survivor camps, etc. And that was really a big part of my healing. Now, I was I was still in touch with my friend, and he went to India to fly f- again paragliding. And then I was like, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go t- with you, and so we can go together, reconnect a bit, and and just yeah, just just help to process all of that. And so um, I was talking to him about to fly to India. Like I think a week from that moment, I was about to fly, and then he's not answering me. I'm like, man, that's a bit odd. The day after, he's not answering me neither. I'm like, whoa. And then I receive a call from a friend who is saying that. Uh, they found his body in the mountain. He went for a flight and he crashed. He, he got stuck in the clouds and then he hit, he hit the rocks at 4,000 meters altitude and and he died there alone. And, you know, I was barely coming back on my feet. This, this was just putting me down so, so much deeper again, thinking like, this is not fair. This guy risked his life to help someone else and now he's, he's just gone. And again, my, my world collapsed the second time. I was looking at this photograph from, from my team from the paragliding competition. And I was the only one left alive on this photo. You know, it was this young guy. He was 21 years old. And then this other friend was also dead. And we're like, geez, what am I going to be next? You know, like this movie, Final Destination, when you have, yeah, like death is coming after the people who should be dying. And I realized, hey, wait a second, of course I'm going to be next. I mean... Eventually, I will die. And I started thinking more about this. I'm like, I got a second chance here. For all those people who died, all those people who didn't have the second chance, I got the duty to make the most out of it, at least to honor the memory, right? And so I was thinking about all of them. And like, I cannot live in this state of of victim anymore. I cannot live in this darkness anymore because I got the chance to be still living today, still breathing, still there, you know? And so... That day, I promised myself, you know what? I'm going to live every single day of my life to the fullest. And I'm going to inspire others to do the same thing. Because not everyone will get a second chance in their life. And that was a big promise I made to myself. And that day, I changed perspective. Because from being a victim, I became a survivor. Now, the event was the same. The pain was not different. But suddenly, the suffering started fading away. Suddenly, I had a purpose again. You know, I, I realized that. There are two truths. We are all going to die. I'm sorry. And nobody knows when. I know it sounds creepy. That's just how it is. That's just life. And we tend to live in denial of our own mortality. Right? We tend to think that I'm immune to problems. I'm going to live forever. And so we live with the illusion of infinite time. We keep postponing our best life for later. I'm going to do that next week, next month, next year. But based on what? We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Time is a scare resource. And when we are completely accepting our own mortality, we can start living more intentionally. We can start deciding how we want to show up and what we want to create in our life. And that was the big shift for me. Because after that, I was like, okay, great. I'm going to live a great life. What does that mean? What does success mean? Well, how do I make the most out of it? Right? And I went so deep in personal growth, not only for me, but for all the people that I lost there. Going from one thing to the other, I realized how little I was living my life. Although I was living a great life, you know, I was traveling all around the world. I still follow my dreams, but still something was missing. This idea of, of purpose was missing. Sorry for the interruption. This is Ian Westmoreland, the founder of Kintsugi Heroes. And thank you for listening to this story from one of our amazing heroes. Our mission is for these stories to provide hope and inspiration to people experiencing life challenges and to also educate the broader community on how best to provide support. If you would like to help us continue to produce more hero stories and cover more adversity themes, we would welcome all donations. These can be made via our website, kitsukiheroes.com.au. The donate function is at the bottom of the homepage. We'd also welcome any feedback. You can email me direct using ian at kitsukiheroes.com. Now let's get back to the story. I like to share this quote that sometimes beautiful gifts come wrapped in ugly paper. This was a very ugly paper, very ugly, (laughs) but a beautiful gift inside. I also realized that pain and suffering are not the same. Pain is a signal that we experience in our life. It's, it's an alarm. It's telling us like something is wrong, either physically or emotionally or mentally, right? 
Suffering is what we do with that pain. The moment we don't accept the pain, we start creating suffering. Now, kids are very good dealing with that. If you see a little kid running around, falling on the ground, hurting himself, be like, oh, I'm, I'm in pain, yelling, screaming, everything. A few seconds later or a few minutes later, running around and being so happy again, right? Because they fully expressed how they felt. And then they did what makes the most sense, which is moving on because they cannot change what is. They can only change their own inner stance and keep moving forward. But we grow up and then we forgot all of that. There is something painful happening in your life and like, no, I don't want it to happen. And then we don't accept it. And that creates suffering and we don't live well with that, right? And so I realized the difference between pain and suffering in that deciding to stop suffering, because yes, it's a decision, is really empowering, but it doesn't make the pain go away. It's not because you stop suffering that you're not in pain anymore. You know, those two things are different. And sometimes I was thinking when I was going through this, to this PTSD that, well, I started telling to people, I'm doing better. That was a few months after, you know, and like, and I could imagine them thinking, oh, that must not have been that bad then. You know, it's like if there's this social construct that, oh, you have a car accident, you need to be, to be depressed for at least two months. You lose your arm at least, at least a year. You lose your partner at least two years. Or what is this? Suffering longer doesn't make the pain bigger. It's two different things. And I was really empowering to go through that. Now, I have to say that if you would have told me just a week after, oh, there is something good out of it. How does that help you grow? I would have punched you in the face because I was not in that space being able to receive that. So I'm not telling people are going to trauma to say, hey, come on, get your shit together and keep going. Absolutely not. We need to have this phase of acceptance, this phase of grievance, this phase of, of going through and navigating all those emotions that we are feeling, right? I can tell that my life completely changed thanks to that thing. And in some ways, I am grateful that this happened to me. It changed my life for the better. And and I'm really on a mission to inspire other people to live the best life. I mean, if you think that a tsunami is never going to happen to you, I mean, so did I. So did I. We think this car accident, oh, not to me. Losing my legs, not to me. Cancer, no, to others, not to me. And we have this, this feeling of going through life this way until it, it hits your heart in the face. And like, oh, oh, I should have changed before. You know, I also said, I don't ever want to live with the desire to give a last phone call to someone like I wanted to do with my, to my wife when I was in that tree. Because you know, when I was in the tree, I was not thinking about my bank account, about the new business that I'm going to create, about my car. I was thinking about the people in my life. I was, I was seeing the smiles, the faces and the experience and the feelings that I got to, to all those adventures and, and those moments connecting with others. So how come I had to make a last phone call? I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to live like, if I die tomorrow, I don't need to tell my parents. I love them. I don't need to tell my friends. I appreciate them to have them in my life. I don't need to tell anyone because they all know. And that's a way of showing up. And I think when we live this way, we live so much more aligned and authentically to who we are and how we want to show up, right? It takes practice. It takes effort to redefine our life and decide how do I want to show up today, right? And that's, I mean, this work did not happen in two weeks, obviously, right? It was years of, of, yeah, going on this journey of discovering who I am and how I want to show up in the world. And no, I'm, I'm on this mission to support people to do the same thing in their life because we should not wait to have the divorce paper on the table before doing something about a relationship. We should not wait to be sick in a hospital bed before saying like, yeah, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise now. You know, we should not wait to have the midlife crisis to actually do the thing that makes the most sense to our life. So we should stop postponing our best life for later because it makes no sense to do so. And I actually wrote a book about this story. And I wrote a book to this, this little girl, her name is Zara, that I saved in, in, in the double natural disaster. Actually, I say I saved her, but she saved me as much as I saved her. Because that day she gave me a purpose. She gave me a reason to fight, but I was nothing else. She was just the only reason I wanted to, to fight to, to keep her safe. Of course, my wife, my parents, my family, but there on the moment, that was for her. And so, I wrote a book to her to, to share different lessons about how not to suck at life. That's the title of the book. I just want to share it. It's The Illusion of Time. I think this is the biggest message I want to give to the audience today is that please stop living with this illusion of infinite time because nobody can say what is in front of us. Starting living your best life today, although it sounds a little bit blah, blah, but it's a choice. It's a choice that you can make. It's a choice that we should make because we can. So we can grow through this empowerment 
we can go to this, hey, what if I take the time to actually think about what do I want out of life? What does success mean to me? In my own metrics, not on, based on other people's metrics, right? How do I want to show up as a friend, as a son, as a brother, as a partner, as a parent? What are the feelings that I want to experience on a daily basis? How do I want to contribute in life? I think this is something that we should be doing with kids at school. I don't want to start on the educational system, but there were so many things missing there. Seriously. How come adults have to try to figure this out and then so not so many people actually figuring this out and like feeling lost after years and years? How come we don't have those tools to give to kids and have those conversations about what is life all about? Anyway, <laughs> I think this is, this is never too late to do it and it's never too early to have this conversation. So thank you so much for listening to this message. I hope that resonates with a lot of people. Oh, wow, Francois, thank you so much. I almost had to get up and go find the tissues. Um, I think I still will after I, after I say goodbye. Um, there's so much in that story. Obviously, you've written the book, which thank you for writing the book. What I really appreciate is that a couple of things that you mentioned, and one was you said we have this expectation as a society that we need to stay in suffering. It's almost like we need to do the time. And we need to pay penance to make it sort of valid. We need to validate our pain by the length of time we allow ourselves to stay trapped in the suffering. And yet the validation doesn't need to happen. Validated for who? Exactly. I'm so happy you bring that up because this is something that it has been a bit controversial when I'm, when I'm sharing that. But I felt so mad in the moment. By saying, no, I have the right to tell people I'm doing better. I mean, PTSD is, is there for long. I still wake up in the night having nightmares when there's a truck passing by and the ground is vibrating. My, my body is getting into, into survival mode. I mean, this is not going away after even, even four years, you know. But I'm saying that the daily suffering, it's a choice to, to decide, like, I'm, I'm not going to stay stuck into that, right? And this idea of needing this external validation, it's, it's rubbish. I mean, sometimes we feel like, I want the world to know that I suffer. Like, sorry, you just need to have that with yourself. You should seek for help, for sure, before it's necessary. I mean, that, that's one of the biggest recommendations. Again, seek for help, for professional help, or just for friends, for people who are there to support you. Absolutely. But having this, I don't know how I can explain with this desire that I want everyone to acknowledge my pain, but that doesn't help you to deal with your pain. Having people pitying you, it, it's not really helping. Right. And every time that someone was coming to me, said, oh, that must have been horrible. Like, well, imagine all these other people. I was scratched here and there. Yes, I lost friends. But I saw those people. I saw mothers crying with, in front of the body of their, of their babies, of their kids laying there, losing not only their the family, maybe their husband, their the children, their friends, their the brothers and sisters, but also their house, their belongings, everything. I don't deserve any of, of you of your compassion right now. And there are people so much worse and there is always going to be someone worse than where we are, you know? And I think this book from Viktor Frankl, Men's Search for Meaning, it, it had such a profound impact on me. I read it just a few months after that and it helped me put things into perspective again uh, by realizing that this, it, it is a, a choice of how do I want to feel and think. And of course it's difficult. I mean, if it was easy, there would not be PTSD, of course. And I think seeking for help is one of the most powerful things that we should be doing. And too many people are afraid of being judged or feeling too vulnerable by asking for help around. Everybody has a different way of coping. You know, my way of coping was was going there and helping the people and and writing my book was very therapeutic for me because I had to put again all, all those thoughts into paper and go deep into revisiting that and then sharing my story until I own my story. You know, I'm going to be shy to say it. I was sharing the story just a few minutes before and yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> my throat, I felt like uh, I want to share the tears because the emotions are still there, but I do own the story and I recognize the story as, you know, I could share the story with you saying, I miraculously survived an earthquake and a tsunami that killed 4,000 people and nearly died. That's it. Or I could say, I survived that. And you know what it taught me? It taught me on the shortness of life. It taught me on the illusion of time. It taught me on how to make the best of all my life and to support people in their quest, in their own journey as well. Th this is so empowering. It's just reframing the script. And that's something we can all do because we all have pain in our lives. We all have suffering. And I'm so sorry to tell you that we're still going to have more pain. I mean, this is part of life. Having this ideal image of a life that is pain-free 
completely certain and effortless. I mean, this is an ideal that was never going to come. And that's why so many people are creating this snapshot of the perfect life and they go to it and then they live this, this life and they realize, well, I'm still in pain. It's still uncertain in front of me and I still have to do a lot of efforts. And then they, they go so disappointed. But we actually, it's about learning how to navigate adversity. It's about giving yourself the tools to be able to use that when emotionally you're a wreck because mm-hmm. it's going to happen again. And the best you are at navigating that, the more you start creating happiness because you learn to enjoy the process of life. Instead of only looking to one point in the future, you enjoy getting there. To use this metaphor, the journey matters as much as the destination. But this is so true that we just have a hard time to assimilate that, to understand it at a core. And so we keep thinking it's going to be better later. The best is yet to come. I had this quote written in my living room for so long. The best is yet to come. And I was like, okay. But this is also rubbish because the best is now. Later, I'm also going to have problems. Do you have problems, Evelyn? Yeah, you do. You're going to have more in the future and you had in the past. The idea is to focus on how can we change the context of our problem? How can we have better or higher quality problem? And this is to me, personal growth. It's creating better problems in your life. Hopefully the listeners understand that you didn't just walk away from that disaster and suddenly become like, you know, have this download of inspiration and get to the point that you're at now. (laughs) It, It comes with a lot of growth time. You had to work through stuff. You had to look at yourself. And, and I can see that from what you're sharing, you've been through that metamorphosis of the suffering into, Hey, I have a choice. What was it that I went through? What did I learn from this? I love the fact that, yes, whilst your disaster was one that not many people will go through, it was, uh, the words to describe it, it's like out of a movie. Whilst I might not go through something like that in my life, I'll still go through challenges. We all will. And that's the point, allowing people to see that there's a different way they can experience their life. Yeah, because everybody can relate to my story through their story. Not to a tsunami per se, because that's very rare. But the tsunami for you was, I don't know, losing a a close one, a car accident or whatever it is. You know, we all have that. The context doesn't really matter. You know, it's it's about the, the problem itself. The adversity that we have to overcome is the same. You know, the feeling of despair, the feeling of frustration, the feeling of anger. I mean, doesn't matter how it's created. It's the same feeling. I, I have a chapter in my book that says about money because, you know, a lot of time we think that it's going to be better when you have more money, etc. That's very fascinating how we can trick ourselves with all of this. Because to be honest, a millionaire that is depressed or someone who is barely making, meeting the end that is depressed, feel the same way. I mean, of course, the rich person is depressed on his private yacht. Maybe it feels a bit more comfort, obviously, but the feeling is the same. And the idea of, oh, but when I have this, when I'm there, when I do that, it's going to be better. That's an illusion. It's not true. Whatever you experience now, you're going to experience the same later in a different context. And so that's why I'm sharing my story. The context doesn't matter. The different steps and the tools and and the growth that comes from Everybody can use that. Absolutely. One of the other key highlights I think that just came to me was this, the concept of time, which is based on, it's all around the the name of the book and that we only really have now. And we don't know when our time is up. Nobody does. And I I just want to play a bit on the words here. Um, First thing about time is that I think Sadhguru is saying that every second, it's not time, but your life that is passing away. And that's quite confronting to think that, yeah, Every day, you're a little closer to your death. <laughs> as scary as it sounds, but that's empowering the same time. Like, hey, I need, to, I need to do things right now. I need to mm-hmm. choose. I need to make peace with time because all of the stuff I want to do in my life, I'm probably not going to be able to do all, everything. And so I need to focus on what matters the most. That was the first thing. And then talking about purpose, you know, I got so much overwhelmed and frustration around purpose because even after that, I mean, I did not wake up one day thinking, oh, this is what I'm going to do in life, right? As you said, it's a process. And I was like, I want to find my purpose. And I was looking for my purpose, but I could not find it anywhere because I realized your purpose is not really something you find, it's something you create. And I'm really careful in language because when you, when you look for it, you're not going to find it. But when you start creating it, it comes from a completely different energy, a different mindset. And 
our purpose is changing. Because I know probably people listening, like, I don't know what my purpose is. My life is, is empty. You know, that's, that's a feeling that I had. And I, I think a lot of people feel the same when they don't know. And so just let this go because the purpose is created and it's created over time and it's going to change over time. And so we need to, to make peace with purpose as well and trusting life that it's going to come. And one last note about trusting life is probably your life is not always the way you want to. You know, we make plans and it does not happen. Because this is life. This is unpredictable. This is, this is just how it is. But what I learned also is that trusting life is really important. To stop fighting what's happening to you, what you cannot change. And I lost my faith in the universe or whatever you want to call it. But I regained it by thinking, I want to trust life to give me what I need. And it's not going to be always what I want. And I'm going to have to make peace with that. But with time... Although I cannot see the good in the situation right now, with time, I trust that I will be able to see how this turned out for the better. Really lovely words. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your sharing, um, for your story, for you, for showing up and what you bring. I like to ask our guests the same question at the end. And okay, not many people have gone through a tsunami. But the question is, if there's someone listening to this who can resonate with your story in some way, and it could be that they've had their own version of a tsunami in their life. You know, is there anything sort of parting words that you'd like to leave them with? Seek for help. And that's something I didn't do at first. And I'm the kind of guy who I do it myself. You know, maybe my military conditioned me a little bit of my big ego took over, like, no, I'm going to do myself. <laughs> but it's just wasting time. I mean, surrounding yourself with people who can support us. I think everybody should have a coach and a therapist. I mean, that that should be the minimum <laughs> to create an amazing life because we all have traumas and we're all going to keep having more trauma. And so learning how to deal with those traumas and then empowering yourself to construct a better future, you know, it's it's working on the past and working on the future while being truly present. This is, this is the magic. I'm not saying I figure it out. I'm still working on it, <laughs> but we know the process. And once again, maybe it takes a whole lifetime to do that. Maybe three, I don't know. But trusting the process and knowing that we always have a choice, although it's very uncomfortable sometimes to say, do I have a choice here? Maybe it's not always your fault, whatever situation you're in, but you do can take ownership of some part of it, even if it's only the way you respond to it. Thank you for coming. It's been an absolute joy and a privilege to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Kintsugi Heroes. Please like and share the show to your friends so we can get this out to even more people. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, please reach out using the contact details below and join us next week for our next Heroes story. Until then, keep being you and remember that we are all heroes in our own unique way.